Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Jones, and I'm delighted to be hosting today's town hall session on the digital divide, which has been made possible by the generous sponsorship of Kaplan and Drysdale. Uh, first, I want to thank ACYPL for inviting me to moderate this conversation. I'm an ACYPL alum, and I was part of the delegation who traveled to Russia in 2014. Being a part of the ACYPL community has been just a fantastic experience for me on a personal level, which is why I didn't hesitate to moderate uh, this panel when they asked. And I have to say the caliber of panelists uh, made it even easier for me to say yes, which you all just see in a moment. Um, we have a very knowledgeable group of panelists here to discuss an incredibly important issue. Um, the digital divide is important to me on a personal level because I come from a part of the country where accessible internet connectivity remains a large issue. Without going into too much detail, I'll just share that I've spent enough time getting Wi-Fi access in the parking lot of McDonald's while visiting my in-laws to have some basic understanding of what it means to be without internet service, but that was just for a short period of time. And according to the FCC, at least 14 and a half million Americans do not have access to broadband internet. But as we'll talk about today, that's only part of the story. Adoption remains a very significant issue even for those with access. Over the past year, as you all know, the digital divide has taken on even greater urgency. Internet access and connectivity is a multifaceted issue that has come to be an integral part of our daily lives. From telehealth visits to distance learning, the pandemic has shown us that ensuring universal connectivity and affordable broadband is more important than ever for the future of education, employment, medical care, criminal justice, and commerce in the United States. It touches everything. Over the course of this town hall, our speakers will address the history and underlying issues that contribute to the digital divide, the trends that we have seen over the past year as a result of stay at home orders and social distancing that have exacerbated connectivity issues around the country, and we'll discuss some of the policy solutions aimed at addressing these challenges. Now let's introduce our panelists in alphabetical order. Uh, first, I would like to welcome Joni Hart to the panel. Joni is the executive director of the Indiana Cable and Broadband Association, which is the leading advocacy coalition of Indiana's broadband providers. In this role, she advocates for technology neutral policies that encourage cutting edge infrastructure investment. And in 2016, she was appointed by Governor Pence to be the, exec to the executive council on cybersecurity and was recently reappointed to the council by Governor Holcomb. Before uh, the pandemic halted travel, Joni was slated to travel on an ACYPL delegation to Morocco and Tunisia in 2020. Thank you for joining us, Joni. Thanks, Eric. So excited to be here. Just Great. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no. Um, it, you, anything else you'd like to share for your introduction? No, just really excited to be here in my, in my current role. I represent Indiana's um, cable broadband providers, uh, over 50,000 miles of infrastructure throughout the state of Indiana, a very uh, rural and agricultural state. Um, broadband's really important um, to our constituencies here, and so really looking forward to the discussion. That's great. Thanks so much for joining us. And I, and I want to say, too, just so everyone knows, that's not a virtual screen behind her. She, that's actually the Indiana State Capitol. Uh, next, I'm pleased to introduce Larry Irving. Uh, Larry is one of the nation's leading thinkers on technology and innovation and previously worked for the Hewlett Packard Company, the world's largest technology company. Uh, notably from 1993 to 1999, Larry served as the Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Communications Information in the Clinton administration, where he addressed social and economic issues through enhancements of telecommunications and information technology policy. Larry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. <clears throat> and then finally, I'd like to welcome uh, Brent Perkins, who is ACYPL trustee and a senior vice president of external affairs at Comcast. In this role, Brent is responsible for local government affairs, strategic partnerships with state and local government tool associations, and national policy organiza advocacy organizations. Prior to joining Comcast in 2001, he served as Vice President of System Services and Assistant to the President at Mercy Health Systems in Pennsylvania and worked in legislative, affair, legislative affairs at Keystone Mercy, Mercy, AmeriHealth Mercy Health Plan and with the North Philadelphia Health System. Brett, thank you so much for joining us. Eric, uh, thanks for having me. and Great to be with you, Joni and, and Larry today. And uh, I'll, I'll add a, a thank you to Libby and the ACYPL uh, team for inviting us to do this, for putting on this, this forum. And I think um, Larry and I would, would 
echo what you said about the experience that we had through ACU IPL. I tell people that it was absolutely life changing for me. I'm forever grateful for the eye opening experience that I had um, getting a chance to travel to Egypt in 2009, right before Arab Spring, and, and meeting some incredible uh, folks, and then traveling to, to New Zealand. So, really glad to be with the ACU IPL community today. Uh, that's really well said. I, I completely agree with everything you just said. Um, so let's move into our uh, questions. Our first question, uh, we're going to start more broadly and sort of start with basic questions about what, what do we mean when we say the digital divide? You know, what is it? Who is most affected? And what are the main barriers to universal connectivity? Uh, Larry, to set the stage, could you walk us through generally what we mean when we say the digital divide? Thanks, Eric. And um, let me also thank ACYPL for a life-changing experience in, in uh, the then Soviet Union in the 1980s. Um, and, you know, the digital divide goes back to the 1990s. It goes back to a time when um, uh, I was Assistant Secretary of Commerce. The internet had 15 million people. And most people in America had no idea what the internet was. And we were noticing early on that there were some people who were very um, active in gaining access to technology and some who weren't. So we did, with the Census Bureau back in the 1990s, a empirical study, the first empirical study of who was online and who wasn't online. Let's fast forward to 25 years um, and we can see that a lot of things haven't changed. In the 1990s, the folks who weren't on, as Joni noted, disproportionately were rural, they were disproportionately poor, they're disproportionately um, ethnic minorities, they were disproportionately less educated, less white collar, um, and they were disproportionately immigrant. So if we look today, um, can we go to the first slide? Who's not online in 2019? Um, <clears throat> disproportionately, uh, the, the biggest group that's not on are folks who don't have high school educations. So the, the less educated you are, the less likely you are to have um, internet access. But if you also look more than one out of four senior citizens over 65 in an era of, you know, where people are staying at home, didn't have broadband before the pandemic start, I don't know that that number is much better. And if you look at the low income, if you're under 30,000, one out of almost one out of five Americans under 30,000 don't have a broadband internet versus fewer than 2% over 75%. So the wealthy have access, least wealthy don't, older don't, less educated don't, and rural, about one out of seven rural Americans don't. Next slide, please. We say that 11% of Americans are offline, and we say that because that's less awful than saying that almost 30 million Americans don't use, um, American adults don't use the internet, and that 90 million Americans don't have home broadband and that 50 million Americans are smartphone, smartphone dependent for internet. Next slide, please. You know, there is a racial component to the, um, to, to the uh, digital divide. 79%, almost four out of five white Americans have home broadband, but one of the, out of three black Americans and 40% of Hispanic Americans don't have home broadband. And again, as I noted before, if you're over 75,000, at least 92%, um, have broadband, while only 56% have home broadband if their income is under $30,000 uh, a year. Next slide, please. Yeah, one of the things that's really troubling is that we often talk about the um, digital divide as being a, a rural issue, but it's also an urban issue. These are 10 cities with um, uh, populations of over 100,000 um, people, and as many as 40 to 60% of those households. In Detroit, it's almost 6% don't have uh, broadband. And as Joni and I were talking about earlier um, this month, um, even in Indiana, uh, Indianapolis, four out of 10 households don't have uh, fixed home internet access. And it's an affordability issue for most of those households. But you have Cleveland, Miami, New Orleans, great American cities where far too many of our fellow citizens don't have home broadband. Next slide, please. And again, if, um, to Joni's point, if you look at the, uh, the rural numbers, it's one out of four, um, according, according to Brookings, but you know, small metro areas, almost one out of 10. The suburbs and um, cities, you have access to broadband as it's defined at 25 megabits per second, but as we'll talk later, um, the affordability and adoption issues are also things we, we take a close look at. Next slide, please. And you know, when we look on our tribal lands, um, we have an atrocious situation, uh, particularly when you think about how the uh, COVID epidemic has affected uh, tribal communities. As many as seven in 10 residents on some tribal um, lands remain without access to fixed uh, high capacity broadband. And some of those communities don't even have cell phone. Next slide. 
the current chair of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, um, helped define the term homework gap. And homework gaps about children who don't have access to broadband internet at home. 70% of teachers today assign homework requires broadband connectivity. Five million low, um, low income households don't have children who don't have internet. And we saw that with the pandemic, the number of children who for almost a year had no or inadequate access to the education that they need and deserve. And sadly, disproportionately affects rural and poor households and households with single parents. Next slide, please. And then if you're talking about uh, black teenagers and Hispanic teenagers, um, again, this is from Pew, they are much more likely to be affected by the digital homework gap, using public Wi-Fi to do their homework, unable to complete their homework because of lack of a reliable computer or internet connection, having to do their homework on a cell phone. And I think that for many of us, and I know for me, the image that I'll never get out of my mind is those two young Latino girls in San Jose in the heart of Silicon Valley, a place where I went to school, and those two young girls were sitting outside of a Taco Bell with a laptop on their lap so they could do their homework because they didn't have homework, uh, the schools were closed, they didn't have broadband in it at home. Next slide, please. Um, one in four low-income teens don't have access to a home computer, um, and, and that's a problem. And again, if you look at the, the wealth disparity, but almost one in five Hispanic teenagers don't have access to a home computer, um, which roughly one in 10 for whites and black uh, teenagers. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, that gives you a sense of where the digital divide is now and, and kind of the evolution of the concept. Thanks for the time, Eric. Larry, that, that's an incredibly helpful um, presentation for table setting. And I will just say that I, I've experienced this issue um, it, it, we're in the part of the country where I'm from. And when you hear digital divide, you often think about access being the issue. Um, but it's been very helpful for me to understand how much bigger the issue is than just access and how it's adoption as well. And I think those statistics speak for themselves. Um, Joni or, or Brett, do you, do you want to add anything to sort of the, just the, the general sort of the general underlying issue we're all facing here? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll add, and, and um, I, I think what Larry said about this is not a new issue is really important. And we all say digital divide. Larry was the person who coined the, the phrase digital divide. Um, so we, we've been talking about this and studying this for for quite some time now. And I, you know, I've been engaged in the last 10 years. And I think what brought this into sharp relief was the obviousness you can't hide from it during the pandemic. Um, everybody who could was working from home and schools, every child needed to learn virtually. Um, and so there's no, it's just some number, it became very, very human. Uh, and so I, I think it is really important to understand the complexity, obviously the table setting, Larry, thank you for doing that, lays out the challenge that we have, um, but you can see um, that there are buckets that those challenges fit into, and we just need to make sure that we've got the right strategies to, to finally you know, put this to bed um, for good for this country. I totally agree. I think um, what Brett said about the buckets, I think one of the most important things um, we've had to do from an advocacy and an education standpoint is really help policymakers and community leaders understand that the digital divide has, you know, at least two components, the access to the infrastructure and um, the ability and willingness for folks to connect. One of the things that we saw really heavily during the pandemic were all those Hoosiers who had been doing their business via a mobile connection um, for years. And then all of a sudden, um, when the need of what you're doing over your connection um, triples or quadruples or, or goes tenfold, um, your ability to do that um, switch switches and pivots. And so I think our membership responded very, very quickly to that. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, no matter or depending on how you want to look at it, I think um, the pandemic did more for broadband adoption than any policy initiative ever could have. And I think now is a really imperative time to how do we grasp that? How do we lasso that? And how do we move it forward from a policy perspective now that, um, now that we saw people getting online in numbers like they never have before? And how do we encourage those who still aren't? Th that's a really good point, Joni. And, and actually, this is, a, I think, a good transition to our, our second question, which just builds upon the discussion we're already, we're already having, in that we've seen an increase in broad broadband demand over the last year as a result of the pandemic. 
Um, and that's highlighted the existing challenges of internet connectivity. Brad, this is a question for you to start. Can you talk about some of the trends you've seen and how Comcast has approached the amplified challenges of digital equity that have been revealed by the pandemic? Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would start with a little bit of my, my previous comment about <clears throat> the amount of work that's been done by, by so many uh, leading up to the, to the pandemic. Uh, and certainly I, f I feel like we had a running start for the last 10 years. We've been working on the digital divide. We have a program that I helped to, to write and launch called Internet Essentials that was geared towards addressing the, the barriers and really barriers that were identified in research and, and things that Larry had done early on that to really get at this, you have to understand, first of all, there's the access piece. Do you have the network? Once you get you know, beyond that, we've got the majority of the country that is covered by a network. So our big issue to solve for is the adoption. And so in the adoption, you've got um, you know, issues around affordability, um, issues around, do you have a, a device, um, basic digital uh, literacy? So um, leading up to the pandemic, we, we were working on this. Um, our program had uh, you know, enrolled um, or, or got over 10 million um, Americans connected. But when everything you know, came to a, a halting stop, uh, we, we sort of switched into gear. And I think you know, Joni would reflect for um, the other uh, cable companies, we had frontline workers. Um, you know, our employees were really, you know, for me, sort of the unsung heroes of making sure that that network stayed up and operational. So that was kind of priority number one. And then, you know, related priority was just getting and keeping everybody connected. And so to this, this point, um, we had Internet Essentials. We um, took a couple of steps, including offering Internet Essentials free for, for 60 days opening up our public Wi-Fi um, hotspots so that people had places to connect. Um, and then what we saw across the year was just, we needed to innovate based on what we were hearing from, from people. So one of those innovations actually started prior to the pandemic. We had lots of partners who were saying to us, we'd like to be able to purchase Internet Essentials for a school or a school district. And once we got into the, the pandemic, we just accelerated that and created something called the Internet Essentials Partnership Program that allowed us then to offer this. So if it was a school or in, in the case of some cities like Chicago and Philadelphia, they could come to us. We have a 995 product and they could offer it essentially at no cost um, to, their, to their students. One of the other things that we heard, again, from our partners was we've got this situation where you've got children who can't. Um, you know, come to school, but for whatever reason, they have a frontline uh, parent or parents, they can't be at home, they need another space, and they have to be connected. Uh, and so one of the asks that we got is, we're going to need help with how do we take places like rec centers and boys and girls clubs, um, and, and put Wi Fi in. So we launched an initiative called Lift Zones, um, which we're over 600. Now, um, we accelerated to you know, get this done this year was going to be next year to have a thousand of those. Again, looking at other connectivity um, options for uh, for these kids. And then we've been involved and I know we'll get into the conversation. This makes it really clear. And to Larry's point, there's an affordability challenge for a bunch of Americans here and we need an option uh, for that. Um, and so we've been active in the, the conversations about the emergency broadband uh, benefit um, and what could come after that. That's great, Brett. And just as, as a quick follow-up, those requests you're seeing for, for assistance, are you seeing those slow down or is it continuing even, even with kids going back to school and things opening up a bit? So it, 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 you know, I think it's continuing because now there's an awareness from everybody. What might have been easy to overlook um, isn't now. So it, it's every child that needs to be connected and, and every family that needs to be connected. Um, and, I, and I think what's been helpful is that the universe of stakeholders has broadened. It's now a healthcare issue, yeah. right? If you are a healthcare provider, or you're an insurer, now you know we can get these folks connected, we can keep them healthier, monitor them, and actually probably reduce costs. So we've got more stakeholders that are, that are in the mix. And I think, you know, net net, that's a really positive thing here. I yeah, think and I, go, go ahead, Johnny. 
I think one of the things to add there that we saw a change in perspective too, and who else was engaging in solving that problem. For instance, I really like I really want to applaud the work that Comcast has done and some of the other providers has as well that have the broadband adoption programs, whether it's a low cost or low income program, the digital literacy, um, those types of tools aim to address bro overcoming broadband adoption. But what we saw in the pandemic were community foundations and cities and other partners like Brett mentioned that we're willing to fill that gap for a school district or fill that gap for certain students within um, a community. And I think that's really an important piece to this. And our, our providers pivoted their programs and, and made it so that a community community foundation could pay for that group. Um, whereas before, while we had these really great and robust programs aimed to getting people connected, it often relied on the parents of a, of a student who really needed connected to the internet. And often the most vulnerable populations relying on them to sign up for um, the programs when there was that knowledge gap that they even exist. So I think the pandemic really changed the focus for outside groups and those partnerships to help facilitate getting those folks on. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Larry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. Um, <clears throat> for years, my wife and I have joked that if I had a nickel for every time somebody had used the term digital divide between 1995 and 2019, we'd be millionaires. And if, if I had a nickel for every time somebody's used the term digital divide since the pandemic started, we'd be billionaires um, <laughs> because nothing has um, focused attention on the digital divide like this pandemic. And not just the United States, but globally, but we're focused, I think today, mostly in the United States. The folks who, you know, there's a front page story today in the Washington Post about um, the court system and broadband. Um, if you were, I have a friend who's a former FCC chair, uh, commissioner who is alive because he engaged in telehealth that most low income people couldn't engage in. He was able to do a conference with his doctor and the doctor heard the cough and said, you need to get your butt into the um, hospital. And he was seconds away from a ventilator by going to the hospital. Imagine if he delayed a day and had had that same cough and then gone in. Um, and when you look at education, I, you know, Brent and, and Joan and I and you and I and Eric, we've talked. And I come from an elementary school in Queens, New York, where 43% of the kids um, don't have home broadband. And more than half the kids were reading a grade level or, low, or, or lower than they should have been given their age take a year of not being in school, of not having broadband at home, um, and think of what happens to those kids. So I applaud the things that Comcast and, and, and many providers have done, um, but I'm also applauding the fact that foundations and policymakers are really beginning to address it. I know we're gonna talk about that later, but you know, New York State just adopted a, a huge bill. Congress is looking at bills. And in the past, we'd look at these bills and be like, well, oh, we're not gonna do much. You know, now the fight is between 65 billion on the Republican side and 100 billion on the Democrat side. So you, all of a sudden, like, you know, I was fighting for pennies and now we really are talking about billions, which shows that folks understand the severity of this, that whether it's criminal court cases or civil cases or healthcare or education, or just being able to um, connect with your family. And I'll, I'll, I'll end on this. My mom's 91 years old and um, she's been in assisted living, but she had an iPad so she could do FaceTime and she could do Zooms with her kids. And I worry about all those parents and grandparents, the one in four senior citizens, mostly because of affordability, some because of um, uh, literacy, but who haven't over the last year been able to physically hug, hug their children and then don't have the technological tools to either. I mean, that's heartbreaking. This has been hard for folks, but technology has made a difference. And so the industry policymakers all need to take a bow, but all of us need to you know, roll up our sleeves and get to work because there's a lot more to do. No, that's, those are great points, Larry. And, and you know, on the, the elderly divide, I mean, you know, I, I, when it came to just getting vac vaccinated um, at the outset, you know, a lot of it was online, right? And um, I was, I had to help my parents and a lot of their friends get vaccinated. Um, one, because they couldn't navigate, but two, some of their friends didn't have great internet. And so it's, 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 um, you know, for better or worse, this pandemic has really highlighted a lot of these issues that have always been out there. And as you know, the hope is that moving forward, we won't just go back to the way it was. We'll, yeah. we'll create something better. Eric, if I might add, because you, you make the point in just this conversation, that this is one of those classic, you know, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, you know, if we, we just look at healthcare, one of the last things I did before uh, I joined Comcast 20 years ago when I was in healthcare is I had a grant from the Department of Defense to study telemedicine using dial-up service 
um, uh, with congestive heart failure patients on a laptop. So most of, mostly uh, seniors. Uh, we proved the efficacy of the technology even on dial-up. Um, and, and also prove that you could, if you spent the time, get um, you know, seniors, um, older adults to use the, the technology 20 years ago, mm -hmm. right? And it was just, we didn't have the will to make it something that we, we had to do. So it just languished, you know, fast forward 20 years and now you have necessity and we figured it out. Um, you know, now I don't think anyone can imagine going back to where I don't have the option to do a telehealth visit. Um, and, and the idea of monitoring is something that makes people healthier, right? And we can do that. Um, we just have to have the will to kind of take the bright, shiny objects and make them things that are practical for, for real people. No, that's, that's a very good point, uh, Brad. And I, I will say, you know, I, before we move to the next question, I, I'd heard about telehealth for years, right? It was just something, this thing was out there. I am now a participant in telehealth. I mean, we, my family has used it repeatedly. I'm sure you all have too. Um, and Larry, that's an incredible story about the FCC commissioner. I mean, um, you know, he, he's posted it on Facebook. He's let folks know. So I don't think I'm, um, I'm violating a confidence, but I remember when he went up to New York last March and I'm like, dude, why are you going to New York in the middle of a pandemic? Um, and then he came back and he got a little sick um, and got very sick. But he's telling a story, and you know, it, it's a story about technology and doctors and 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 fortune, um, his good fortune. Um, but it's a very human story, and it's a very relatable story because any of us can, you know, if, if you if your doctor knows you well enough to know when he she or and his doctor was a woman looked in his eyes and said, you know, you're not look you're looking green around the gills, and that yeah. cough is worrisome. That's what you want, like you know, health isn't just getting better; it's also taking care of yourself so you don't get sick, um, and you know. All of a sudden, with telehealth, we can have these conversations. My mom, um, again, you know, at 91 assisted living, she's had three or four health um, visits with neurologists and um, eye doctors and every audiologists and everybody else over these technologies. Now, the eye doctor wasn't a great visit, but the ability to use some of these technologies um, um, to keep folks who don't need to be out and about. And, and I have to commend Brett for remembering and, and noting for all of us. And here in Washington, D.C., I live in um, a relatively affluent part of the city. And when they first, I got my vaccinations early because I had internet access. So when they first opened up, I was able to go to a poorer part of the city and get vaccinations because the folks who live there didn't have access. I felt a little guilty, but I'm a D.C. resident. I'm old enough to get the vaccination. But I do worry about that person with more comorbidities, less income, who's out in the street and isn't doing his work like I am from Zoom. What happened to him or her because they didn't have access to the internet and weren't able to get that shot in February like I did? Are there people who aren't alive today because they didn't have internet access and couldn't get a vaccine in time to avoid getting disease in rural America and in low-income parts of this country? Those are the things I worry about. Don't you think that also highlights the need to continue to build confidence, trust, and the digital literacy skills too? Absolutely. So um, my my parents are older and did get COVID earlier on in, in the year. And um, almost all of their state health department updates and all of their um, things were all of a sudden virtual. And uh, again, me too. I was in the in the position where I was ha having to help them understand where they can go and what they can do. And I think the digital literacy part of how we engage, we've all talked about how telemedicine has been available, but the building of the trust and the ability to use the platforms and how we speak of that, speak about that and how we train generations um, to use that infrastructure is is really important as well. Absolutely. No, that's exactly right. Um, and, and before we, I, I think I'll move on to the next question, unless anyone else wants to, to weigh in. Um, but Larry, I, I read about the, uh, the FCC commissioner on Twitter, so I don't think you were sharing anything that wasn't out there. Um, uh, the, the next question is, um, Joni, I'll direct this one at you. Um, as you work at the state level on these issues, um, I'd like to talk about uh, broadband, let me back up, broadband access and connectivity are often framed as a rural issue. Um, given that you're working at the state level on this and probably sort of have a good sense for it given the kind of state that's, that Indiana is, uh, what do you see as the main barriers to internet con connectivity um, in Indiana? Oh, um, 
Um, I think making sure we're all having the same conversation is probably barrier number one as far as policy making, making sure that we understand what are access issues and what are adoption issues and the mechanisms and the policies we're putting um, forth to address both of those. Um, Indiana, like many rural states, has um, been dominated and we've been discussing broadband for 10 plus years now. Um, just in the last two budget cycles, I think uh, the state changed and was willing to invest um, money, their own money into uh, the issues. I really commend our legislatures and our and Governor Holcomb here in Indiana. The in 2019, um, they invested 100 or put 100 million dollars towards access issues, um, and then we just completed our uh, or adjourned for our legislative cycle. Um, yesterday um, where they have now put 250 million more into um, mostly broadband access and so i think the level of commitment has increased significantly over the last few years i think understanding the issues is more important than ever before so for instance i think the example larry gave at the opening about indianapolis and the adoption levels in indianapolis is a really great way to look at it so for those of you who don't know, Indiana has just over, you know, 6 million um, residents and there are nearly a million here in Indianapolis. As Larry shared and illustrated, the adoption levels in Indianapolis, a very urban um, area, is uh, just over 40%. And so when you ask whether this is a rural issue or um, an urban issue, I think it's a really, really mixed bag. I think a lot of people want to um, make um, urban an adoption issue only and access a rural issue only, but I think um, access is mostly a rural issue, but adoption is both an an urban and rural issue. So nine out of 10 Hoosiers have access to internet infrastructure and our adoption rate is closer to 60 or 70% and in some communities, um, 30 and 40%. And so how do we um, develop policies? The Indiana General Assembly has been focused almost uh, exclusively on access issues for the last decade. And just since we've started facing pandemic issues, I think there is a willingness and an understanding of the adoption issues and how do we really help people subscribe. So um, just this year, um, there is a K through 12, we, we debated um, voucher programs, much like the Alabama program where they put $100 million into broadband adoption. Um, and, and we, uh, almost got there here in Indiana. Um, we had an adoption voucher component throughout the legislative session and we did make some progress and a step forward with um, some voucher type programs for K through 12 students. But I think we were kind of thrown a curveball when the federal government um, put the adoption voucher program out there. I think that that scared uh, the state a little bit. And so they did uh, approve an adoption component, but it requires federal monies to be exhausted first or federal uh, vouchers to be exhausted first. Got it. So, so Joni, would you say in Indiana now, when, when, when we're talking about, the, the, when we use Larry's phrase, the digital divide, are we are, are legislators use, sort of using that to refer to both access and adoption? Or do you think they're still sort of focused on more, they more think about access as opposed to, to both. So, and that's why I say it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I think for a solid decade, it has been exclusively from a legislative perspective focused on access. Um, and I think that's normal in a, in a r more rural state. Right. Um, because I don't think a lot of policymakers can even conceive that if someone has infrastructure available to them in this day and age that they would not subscribe. Um, However, um, these barriers do exist, whether it's cost or trust or digital literacy, um, those, are, those are the things that we have to overcome. And um, I think we're just now starting to see um, many years of education where policymakers are really understanding and whether it's the pandemic adding to that heat or whether it's now, I think that the state is putting their own dollars into um, access and into deployment. I think they see it more than ever with 
investing that own money and having the skin in the game, seeing what those uh, subscri subscription rates look like, even now that the st state is directly invested. Got it. And Larry, you, you've spent a lot of time working on this issue. Can you sort of provide your perspective on, yeah, it's, on the it's, phrase and how it relates to so know, the various things? When we started the digital divide, we were talking about any American who didn't have access for whatever reason. We were, we didn't really care. We were agnostic about why you didn't have it, whether it was, it wasn't available, you couldn't afford it, you didn't want it. Because one of the interesting things I've always noted, and, and, and it's important to say, is that for Black Americans and Latino Americans, even at the same income level as, as white Americans, early in the days of the internet, Black and the Hispanics were less likely to go on the internet until the internet went wireless. Um, and, then, um, and then you started noticing Blacks and, and Hispanics over-indexed on wireless um, uh, internet connectivity um, and still under internet index, indexed on wired. Now, when we all kind of know we need capacious broadband, you're beginning to see some leveling out of that and, and folks don't want to have their primary access be just a wireless or solely wireless device. You know, I've taken to um, using another term. Um, we went from the digital divide to the homework gap and the Brits and the Aussies use the term digital poverty. And I'm using the term digital poverty a lot to discuss both the adoption and affordability gap in America, because I think digital divide has become so ingrained as Joni said, over the last 10, 15 years. And, 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 and it was a political perspective that I, that I could get into, but I won't, but like it, when, when I left the government in 2000, the Bush administration wouldn't use the term digital divide because they didn't want to create another quote unquote entitlement program. And so that program went away. And then over the, la the last FCC, um, and they're friends of mine, um, but the chair Ajit Pai, whenever he talked about digital divide was only talking about rural. Um, and, and again, it's important to remember there are three to four times as many low income urban and suburban Americans who aren't online as there are rural of any income who aren't online. And one shout out to a friend, um, there's a young woman named Dominique um, Harrison who, um, who's writing a report um, in the next few weeks about poverty, um, rural poverty and the digital divide because the people who are really in extremis are, you know, if you're, if you're rural and rich, you can get broadband. I mean, it, it's expensive, but you can get it. If you're rural and poor, you don't have access and you can't afford it, even if you do get it, that's a double whammy. And so there are so many problems facing our rural Americans that putting another obstacle in front of them, you know, drive long distance for doctors, schools are long distances, um, they don't have the infrastructure they need, uh, the economies there have been harmed by this pandemic, and then you, you know, and then you don't have broadband, that's a parade of horrible. So I'm always gonna be, if you don't have broadband as an American policy person, I don't care what the reason is, I want to help you have it. Um, and to Joni's point, we're beginning to see state legislators, but also, and I know we'll have some time to talk about it, at the federal level, folks are stepping up and they're stepping up in big ways. I would say it's about a decade late, but better late than never. Right. I would just totally agree. Like if you don't have internet, we all want to solve that problem. But I think the, the biggest thing is the how. If you don't have it, the tools we get you for an access issue are much different than the tools we get you for an adoption issue. And I think that's what we're seeing at the state level more than ever, particularly now that we're investing in deployment, is that we can build you four networks. And if your issue is an adoption issue, that isn't going to solve your problem. So how do we get you the toolbox that helps you connect and subscribe to the internet? And in, in addition to uh, affordability, how, how big of a role do, and, and please anyone jump in, do you think digital literacy plays? Um, is, it, is it a small piece of that puzzle for adoption or is it as is it, uh, is it, is important as, as affordability? I, I mean, I, I don't know if I put it as important as affordability, um, but I, yeah, I think I'd, I'd step back and say in the adoption space, it's complex. And I think that's been the hardest thing um, for folks is, you know, we want the silver bullet, this is what it is. And, and we know that affordability is a really big challenge uh, in here. Even that has some complexity to it. And, and even if you make it at no cost, you're still going to have people who don't take it for a range of issues that you just have to understand. Uh, and so you have in this country, we have a an housing challenge. So you have, you know, children who are in transient housing. And so the idea that they're going to get you know, a fixed, uh, fixed uh, wired solution, probably not going to work for them. Uh, uh, you know, if you're moving between adults or from a homeless shelter to some other place, you've got significant language barriers. Um, and, 
and you have a reading problem. So we, you know, we've talked about like digital literacy, uh, but if you don't have basic literacy, digital literacy doesn't mean anything, right? Yeah. Um, you, know, you, you might be able to play a game on your phone, but the idea that you're going on and doing some sort of search or you're learning how to you know, take a course, that's out the window. So like, there's some basic building blocks that you have to understand and, and appreciate and actually get your hands dirty to, to figure out. Um, and, and I think about my own healthcare experience. So I, we talked about this earlier. I got some apps and, uh, and, and I realized like, it's not quite there yet. It's a little bit hard. It's much better than it was, but you have to have knowledge of how these things work to have them work well for you, right? And so I'm not a digital native, but I spend a lot of time. So it's easier for me. So the adoption for me is easy. Now I know here are the four things I have to do. It's not intuitive, but if you're someone who's coming to the first time, there's just no way. And the people who are developing it aren't quite yet in the minds of the folks who've got to cross that chasm. We tend to think now and design things just as a digital native, as opposed to those who still uh, have to cross that, that divide. Yeah, no, go ahead, Larry. I want to piggyback a little bit. Um, part of it's affordability. Part of it's not understanding the technology. Part of it has to do with marketing, how you know how this thing was marketed early on. Part of it's about how people use technology. But to go, get to Brett's first point, you know, in New York City, 1.1 million um, K-12 students in public schools, 100,000, almost 10% of those kids are homeless. What do you do for a, what do you do for 100 thousand under 18 five to 18 year olds who don't have a stable address but their schools are closed and they need to get educated that's a problem um when we look at a housing um stock most public housing in america is under broadband if that's a term um so how do we solve that and so income people living in public housing and why haven't we over the last 25 years as we've invested money in public housing made sure that those public housing complexes have modern broadband we know they're going to need it, and, and we're rethinking those kinds of, of uh, initiatives. We've also tried to patch the problem with existing programs. I helped create the Lifeline program in the 1980s when I was a Hill staffer, which gives you $10 a month toward either a cell phone or broadband or a, um, a dial-up phone at your home, but only one of those, and $10 doesn't buy you much broadband. So it's become kind of the uh, uh, model for EBB but should we be thinking about different models? Um, because you know we're looking at three to 10 to $20 billion a year to bring these costs down of, of, of dollars. Where are those dollars gonna come from? And do we use those in perpetuity? So as we look at di digital poverty, what are all of the tools in the toolbox we should be looking at? The, and is who's doing the really hard analysis that Brent kind of uh, um, alluded to and Joni alluded to, not only, why, not only who's on, but why aren't they on? So when we do broadband maps, we don't do affordability. We don't, we don't add cost to the consumer on our broadband maps. We just have a map that people either connected or not connected, but we don't know what the cost in Montana versus Indiana versus Harlem is. Why don't we have that kind of data too, which will give us some ideas of what are the gating factors from people having broadband. So there's a lot of work to be done. I'm excited that the state and federal and local levels is being done, but there's a lot that we don't know that we need to know. Yeah, no, those are great points. Johnny, go ahead. You're about to speak. Uh, I think Larry gave a really great illustration about New York City. Uh, to give an Indiana type of example, or more rural state example, Indiana has over 600,000 um, students on free and reduced lunch. And that really um, gets to the point, if they're struggling to put a meal on the table, it's often going to be a struggle to have a broadband subscription. And again, those students are all, also often transient and hard to reach at home. So our companies like my our member companies have had really robust broadband adoption programs pre pandemic we were connecting 30,000 Hoosier uh, students to one of our broadband adoption programs um, prior to the pandemic and so I, I know that that has exploded, um, but that's still 600,000 uh, of Hoosier students that are free and reduced lunch, that those are exactly the folks that we're talking about when you look at the gap between having access but still not subscribing. You know, and I, I'm piggybacking on, on something Joni said, it made me think about this, that just now, somebody forwarded to me last week, um, it was a, a doctor's office that was promoting the EBB. Um, it's, you know, it's got a diverse client base um, and there'd be people who qualify and you, you think about how we should 
um, view this, not as a, it's a bolt on, you know, somewhere off here technology, but in the end, if it's this important, um, then it has to be woven into everything that we're thinking about. It's workforce development, it's healthcare, it's banking, it's education, uh, you know, and it's work. Uh, and in all of those intersections are opportunities for us to, you know, get the increments over the over the line and and there's friction involved in this i think you know people want an algorithm to solve for this and there's no algorithm for it some of this gets down to you know you you have a piece of this that's really hard to you know to build out to there's friction in that and then you have you know people in this country that are having a hard time folks that um, you know don't have a home that don't make a lot of money that have mental health uh, challenges the rest of that that's just the hard work that you, you got to be okay with develop systems that bring everyone along and don't make it just that, you know, folks who, you know, have a job and make a certain amount of money and live in a certain zip code are going to get all the goods and everyone else is kind of like roll the, the dice. And if I, you know, Eric, if I could, one, one thing yeah. um, on that, um, when we, we talk about the, the digital divide uh, and I know that Larry and, and Joni and I were talking about this before. I, I, I like to also throw in, just because of the last point I made, um, that the skills piece of this really is important. And we think about well, what do we want from an outcome? Um, so here we know we want every child to be connected uh, to school so they can get their education. Um, but, but we also know that the digital skills are so important and those are not uniformly distributed, those opportunities, so that if you're in a certain school district or come from a certain um, you know, household income, you're gonna get opportunities to learn digital skills, um, to be uh, uh, able to go into certain kinds of jobs. And if you're you know, building a business, you might have greater opportunities to build a, a tech business, depending on what you look like and where you come from. And I think we, we should add that in. First two, really, really important, but migrate up in our thinking about outcomes that we also want to make sure that the use side of this um, you know, gets closed as well. Two really quick points to follow his point, quick point. Um, one, we have an opportunity, you know, when, when you look at, at the low income communities, we, we talked about this in, in a couple of weeks ago, you know, my mom likes a bakery. When the, when the pandemic hit, that bakery, bakery was able to continue to stay open. And I was able to get my mom's favorite pastries by going online and just showing up at the door. I like bean pies, which is a, 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 a nation of Islam makes these things called bean pies. And the guy in DC who makes bean pies wasn't online. He's out of business because he didn't, he couldn't go online. He was in a black community, didn't have the skill set to do it. And people, and there are businesses in between. But when you think that 40% of small businesses closed during the pandemic, and many of them did be closed because they couldn't take their business, go online, whereas businesses that could go online continue to at least keep their doors open, even if they didn't thrive. And then when you think about the kind of skill set, so let's say we were able to connect everybody in America, in low income communities in Philly or Indianapolis or where I grew up in New York, you get a laptop, you get a, your um, iPad and it breaks. Well, where I live now, I walk to you break, I fix, it's a couple of blocks away, pay the guy a hundred bucks, I get it and go back. There's no you break, I fix in low income communities in Indianapolis or in West Philly or in, um, uh, in, you know, in parts of Harlem, parts of Southeast Queens where I grew up. You could train, you, you could create economic opportunity for people who could provide those services. You could train them. You could give people more op, um, options in terms of how to fix these things. We need a robust rethinking of what being connected in a digital age means. And the good news is this pandemic has given all of us the incentive to think those thoughts and to drive those kinds of outcomes. Yeah, Larry, and, and th that's a really important point. And I was just thinking back to something you said earlier about that broadband map, because I think we can all visualize that map and you see those places where it's not. And what we're thinking, I think a lot of people falling into this is we just want to fill in that map, right? right? That's what we're trying to achieve. And, you know, if I could snap my fingers and make that whole map the same color, it wouldn't solve the problems we're talking about here. I mean, it would, it would help with it, right? But it right. wouldn't, it would, we would, the, the digital divide would still exist in rural and urban parts of this country. You still have a lot of poor people in both rural America and urban America who don't have broadband because they simply can't afford it. Even if we had access, and I think we need to invest the money in the same way we did electricity, the same way we did um, 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 telephones, we need to invest the money as a nation. We all benefit and we're all connected. But then we've got to make sure that the lowest income folks who, if it's right, going past your door in Brooklyn and you don't have $30, it's no better than if it's not going past your door in Cut and Shoot, Texas, and you don't have $30. Either way, you're not connected. We need to understand that that's the goal is connect everybody and figure out what the mechanisms are depending upon the geography and the economics to get those folks connected. 
Right. No, that's those are so such important points. Um, we're wow. This I you know I I really I hope people can tell I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, but we are we are getting short on time. Um, so I'm going to move to the next question uh, because I do want to talk about we've been alluding to it. I do want to talk about some of the proposals that are out there right now and where we think things could be going and potential solutions. Um, so Joni, why don't we start with you? Um, if you can talk a little bit about what policies and programs are currently in place sort of in Indiana. I know you've, you've, you've gotten into some of it already. So if, if you feel like you've covered it, great. But And then let's talk more broadly about what we're seeing at the federal level too and sort of bring in a, a broader discussion. Sure, I think um, I'll, just, I'll just briefly mention, um, I think the state of Indiana has shown a very big commitment to deployment and has committed um, $100 million the first a um, couple of rounds for next level connections, our rural broadband grant program, and now has just put 250 million um, to the next level connections fund, um, all designed um, both to spur deployment to rural areas that lack access, um, but now focusing with some priorities on schools and rural health clinics and K through 12 students and, as well. Um, again, with a component that allows uh, for folks, if they have exhausted federal vouchers, um, to still have an adoption availability at the state level. Um, the one unique thing that we did this session that hasn't existed through uh, past programs was a line extension component. So one of the big issues we saw, particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, were those people who were just off of our existing infrastructure and they may be a mile or a mile and a half just outside of our networks and our footprints. And we would get calls here at the association and, and at the providers as well that would say, I can see your infrastructure on the pole just down from my house. And unfortunately, we were absolutely willing to build there, um, but the price tag may be $30,000 to get there because that's, that's just what it cost. And so um, the state of Indiana did do a new line extension program where for projects that's you know $25,000, um, we can do that line extension um, and have it do really quickly too and not just wait on um, maybe a twice a year grant program, but a quarterly program to build it out quickly. And then again, support, support an adoption program where the federal government may not be able to cover for whatever reason. Got it. And, and thanks, Joni. And, and speaking of the federal government, Larry, can you, I know we're running a little short, but can you talk about what policies and sort of have been, and programs have been out there, but then also sort of bring in I'll what be, it looks I'll like now where we're headed? I'll try to be quick. Um, you know, we had the uh, Recovery Act, we had the CARES Act, which is putting billions of dollars into both rural connectivity and some affordability, the um, emergency broadband benefit, which is $3 billion plus. Um, we've got $285 million that's going to historically black colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, tribal colleges to try to connect those institutions and the communities around them with the disproportional income. And we're having some really good debates in the United States right now about what the future of mapping should look like, what um, uh, additional money we need, how do we, um, how, what's the EBB, you know, which is $3 billion this year, but what's it look like? Okay. What are the roles of community networks? What are the roles of the existing providers? How do we, you know, um, I saw a big story yesterday in Politico about the fiber guys versus the cable guys versus the um, uh, wireless guys all having debates. And these are important debates to have, they matter. Um, what I will leave our audience is, we have three of the most phenomenal public servants in the world outside of the White House lead, helping to lead this. Um, Chairman uh, Rosenworcel at the FCC, Secretary Yellen at Department of Treasury has $10 billion at, at, at this, and she's working close with Gina Raimondo, a former governor from a rural state, Rhode Island, who runs my old department, Department of Commerce. Um, and I think those three women um, over the next five to seven months are going to be as important as anybody's ever been in terms of determining who in America gets access to broadband. I, I would say Department of Agriculture, but I didn't work there and I don't know that secretary. I know the other three women, so I know they're going to do a great job and I'm really excited about it. That's helpful. Brent, do you want to add anything on sort of on, on where these issues are and, and where you see them going? No, I, I, I mean, I, I'd agree with uh, both what uh, Joni and Larry said. Um, I, I think it'll come back to something we said earlier on, which is um, being clear about priorities um, and, and focus on 
um, each of the buckets that we need to take care of. A lot of money is being talked about, which is good, right? You know, we talked about what a difference it was before where Larry had to fight for pennies and nickels, and here we're talking about billions of, of dollars. But we've also seen us get kind of over, you know, enthused about that and miss the mark. And so here, if we're going to do it and somebody has to pay for it, let's make sure that we get it get it right. Uh, so if we're talking about, um, you know, accessibility, we know we've had this rural issue. Let's make sure that we're getting that right. Um, you know, close that this issue of, uh, of affordability. We now have this experience. We've got lessons learned from it. Let's make sure that we get that right. Um, so I don't think I would add anything else that wouldn't take us for another hour. Um, Can I add well, one, one other piece, though? Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, we have time. This is a global issue, and this is ACYPL, and the folks who, who are watching this have experienced, you know, life across the planet. We're learning, you know, the ITU, this young woman named Doreen Bogdan Martin, who um, used to work with me in the Commerce Department, who runs development, um, the Development Bureau at the uh, ITU. We need the lessons learned from all over the country, all over the planet. You know, what is, what's New Zealand learning? What's Australia learning? What are the Germans learning? How are people using technology? And then share what we're learning because you know, we have over a billion kids on the planet that were locked out of school last year. And every kid on this planet needs to be educated. And this technology is the way to get them educated. So when, when I think about ACYPL, I think of the world. And I wanna make sure that the folks who are listening to this know that the problems we're solving in the United States have a global implication, but the solutions that are global may have application here in the United States. And we need to be willing to absorb uh, the knowledge of our friends and share the knowledge that we have. That's a great, that's a really good point there and tying it back into AC, ACYPL is, was, that's a good thing to do. That's uh, sort of captures our audience, right? Well, we, well, we all love this organization. So no, that's we, why we're here. It's, it's so true. Um, I, I wanted to, you know, and speaking of our audience, um, a, a question came in from um, an alum, uh, Sam Mudrick, and I thought I would just close with one question that came in and then, then we'll sort of go into the, some of the closing statements. Um, Sam asked, we've seen the growth of telemedicine and e-learning with increasing speed during the pandemic. What untapped or unexpected industries do you predict will be altered and improved in the future through technology and broadband? Hmm. And this is, I'm putting everyone on the spot because we did not prepare for this. All one. of them. But uh, it, anyone have anything to share on that? You know, I, I'm going to go small businesses. I, I honestly think, you know, I'm looking back at the 40% of small businesses closed. And I really do think, you know, there's a great survey by GoDaddy that um, called Venture Forward. And they talk, you can go to GoDaddy and then backslash Venture Forward. And they talk about, and I, they're not a client. I have no uh, affiliation. <laughs> I just think they're doing good work. Um, and what's important about that GoDaddy study is it shows that access to broadband helps small businesses and it helps the communities those small businesses are in. They have whatever, 20 million um, different people who have URLs because of GoDaddy, and many of them are small businesses. So they're looking at how they're interacting both before and during this pandemic. I think they're onto something that small businesses, micro businesses in particular, are going to thrive when they figure out how to use this. And they're disproportionately immigrants, disproportionately women, disproportionately low income people who create those micro businesses. If we can get them leaning forward, it will be a great thing. So I, I might jump in because uh, Sam and I spent a little time in New Zealand together. So first of all, Sam, hey, good to see you kind of virtually. Uh, <laughs> and and I, I piggyback on with, with Larry. I was going to say uh, something around business in general. Um, you know, the idea that we, if everyone is connected and the experience from, uh, from the pandemic that virtual can be okay, location matters a little less. I mean, we all know somebody who made a life change and said, I'm gonna live someplace else because uh, I, can, I can dial into it. And I think we might see smart city applications take off in a way that they hadn't before. If, if we have ubiquitous coverage, ubiquitous access uh, and adoption that things that might've been kludgy uh, might get over the, over the hump and, and really take off. Great point. Well, I, uh, Joni, did you have anything to add? I would echo those things. I think it's absolutely right. I think to Brett's points earlier, those businesses ready to pivot and use this platform and being able to make a setting like this personal and connected, I think those will see where, I think that will be where we see the most transformative change because we've all been on these meetings for a year now and there are lots of positive uh aspects of it, but they can also be very draining. And so how do we get the personal connective uh, uh, qualities amongst this type of platform? And I think that will be really exciting to see what businesses harness that. 
those were all uh, great points. And I, I knew you, you all would be ready for a question that just came out of nowhere. So well done. Um, that is, I think we're, we're, we are running out of time. And so I'm going to start um, closing this down. And I want to first say thank you to the panelists for your time uh, and for sharing your expertise on such an important topic. I personally think it was a great conversation. And I'm confident that there are people around the country who feel the same way. Typically, you'd get a round of applause if we were doing this like we used to, but I guess just know that it's happening all over the country instead of in just one room right now. So um, thanks for doing it. It was really, it's been really great working with all of you on this. Um, and let me just say one thing about um, the ACYPL has asked me to make a statement about the surveys that they, that they ask you all to do. Um, as ACYPL's work remains uh, virtual during the pandemic, um, it's vital that, that we measure the impact and effects of the virtual town hall series for our funding partners. To do this, we ask that audience members complete a brief exit survey. Uh, if you're on Zoom, you can view the survey link on the Zoom post attendee screen and we'll also receive it in an email tomorrow. So I implore you to, to do the survey. And then if you're viewing on Facebook Live or on YouTube, you can find the survey link in the video description on the respective platform. So, and thank you in advance for taking the survey and helping us measure the impact of the programming during this time. I'll just do one last plug, please do it. These surveys are really helpful. And then finally, uh, thank you to all of you for watching. Um, and again, to Kaplan and Drysdale for sponsoring uh, this event. It's really been, um, I've learned a lot myself from doing this. So I really enjoyed doing it. And thanks again to the panelists and everyone have a great afternoon and weekend. Thank you. Thank you.